Today I want to look more at the roots of this fascist corporatist system and how it developed, specifically with regards to the healthcare industry, because obviously that is something of pressing importance for Americans and people around the world in this day and age. And it's important to know that this did not come about through happenstance or mere chance. This happened as a result of a concerted and carefully plotted plan that was laid out generations ago by people with with malice aforethought, we'll put it that way. And just for an example of how and when and why and who this plan developed and originated from, we should turn back to that uh, that book that we opened today with, with reading that, that short passage from the introduction. I mentioned it was by E. Richard Brown. It was published by University of California Press in 1979. But I did not mention the title of that, the, that book, which is Rockefeller Medicine Men, Medicine and Capitalism in America. Oh, that's right, folks. The American healthcare system really does go back to the Rockefeller family. As the legislatures under Rockefeller's uh, leadership, he set up the American League of Municipalities, which controlled all the small towns in the United States, and the American Association of State Governments, which controlled all the state governments in the United States, including the legislatures, and he used the state legislatures to draft uh, new co methods for controlling uh, doctors and hospitals. And so all hospitals and all doctors had to be licensed through state legislature, which sounded wonderful if you didn't know what was going on. <laughs> that you had to go through John D. Rockefeller to get a medical license and a hospital license. Wow. That's, that's what they're about to. And that's the system we have today. And today we've become the sickest station in the world and the most expensive medical care in the world, except you never get well. <laughs> Which seems to work out for everybody except the patients. Where it's good for the doctors, isn't it? Good for the doctors. It's Drug good for companies. Oh, yeah. So everybody's happy except the poor patients. <laughs> and whenever you go to a doctor today and he prescribes a medicine for you, he says, you're going to have to take this medication for the rest of your life because it's against AMA principles to ever cure anybody. They've actually uh, brought doctors up on charges of curing people. <laughs> and they've drummed some of them out of the AMA for that very reason, because you're curing people. <laughs> because this might be the right thing to do, but uh, from a business standpoint, it's better to keep them sick and sure. keep them buying the medicine, which they buy from the Rockefeller drug companies and go to the Rockefeller hospitals, and everybody's happy. And now they have the scam where the, if you can't afford it, the government's going to buy the drugs from the Rockefellers and give it to you, right? Well, that's why they had the Medicare system, because they developed Medicare. You know, for, for, I point out in my book, uh, a Murder by Injection, that for many years, the AMA spent millions of dollars in Congress to fight Medicare because it was called government medicine, and they didn't want, the doctors were very independent, and they didn't want the government to control their business. Well, they wound up as uh, employees of the government, and that's what they are. And now this new drug act, they're going to supply the drugs to the people that can't afford it with the taxpayers' money, but the drug companies will still get the, the, the money. They get the money. Yeah. Because a lot of the people are... Uh, are buying drugs today and medications, like elderly people like myself, they couldn't afford the drugs, and so uh, the government would pay for them. <laughs> what a racket. Well, it shows that these people are good businessmen. They're yeah, well, very good, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not, they're not very ethical, though. Uh, well, you and I could never think of <laughs> such a diabolical plan. <laughs> Well, that's right. You and I never could think of such a diabolical plan, but unfortunately that doesn't stop those who can, and we suffer from a lack of imagination on many of these subjects, which makes us perfect victims for those who would so abuse positions of power and influence in order to increase one's own profitability. Rockefeller's roots, ironically enough, really does go back to medicine, aka, aka fake medicine, aka snake oil, as uh, the progenitor of the Rockefeller dynasty, John D. Rockefeller's father, was in fact not only a bigamist and a, and a, a shuckster, but in fact uh, also someone who literally sold snake oil, um, a, attempting to cure people's cancer. Um, and billing himself as a doctor when he was, in fact, not a doctor. So the Rockefellers' roots and their, their, their first uh, attempt at amassing a fortune really does go straight back to the idea of 
um, well, attempting to cure people's cancer while doing nothing of the sort. That's just an ironic bit of history lesson. The answer to this question may be found in some historic events that took place almost a century ago, when official medicine finally managed to gain the upper hand on the so-called empirical doctors, who cured patients with herbs and natural remedies. In the 1800s, society sanctioned both approaches to healing. Patients had a choice of using either doctors, called allopaths, or natural healers, called empirics or homeopaths. The two groups waged a bitter philosophical debate. The allopathic doctors called their approach heroic medicine. They believed the physician must aggressively drive disease from the body. They based their practice on what they considered scientific theory. The allopaths used three main techniques. They bled the body to drain out the bad humors. They gave huge doses of toxic minerals like mercury and lead to displace the original disease. They also used surgery but it was a brutal procedure before anesthesia and infection control. Few patients were willing to have surgery. Most patients feared allopathic methods altogether. Satirist of the day remarked that with allopathic treatment, the patient died of the cure. Competing with the doctors were the empiric healers. Contrary to the doctors, they believed in stimulating the body's own defenses to heal itself. Instead of poisonous minerals, they used vegetable products and non-toxic substances in small quantities. They especially favored herbs learned from Native American and old European traditions. The empirics said they based their remedies not on theory, but on observation and experience. Satirists of the day added that with empiric treatment, the patient died of the disease, not the cure. And the balance of medical power remained equal until the turn of the century. Then, new medical treatments emerged that were potentially very profitable. The AMA joined with strong financial forces to transform medicine into an industry. The fortunes of Carnegie, Morgan, and Rockefeller financed surgery, radiation, and synthetic drugs. They were to become the economic foundations of the new medical economy. The takeover of the medical industry was accomplished by the takeover of the medical schools. Well, the people that we're talking about, Rockefeller and Carnegie in particular, came to the picture and said, we will put up money. They offered tremendous amounts of money to the schools that would agree to cooperate with them. The donors said to the schools, we're giving you all this money. Now, would it be too much to ask if we could put some of our people on your board of directors? to see that our money is being spent wisely. Almost overnight, all of the major universities received large grants from these sources and also accepted one, two, or three of these people that I mentioned on their board of directors, and the schools literally were taken over by the financial interests that put up the money. Now, what happened as a result of that is that the schools did receive uh, an infusion of money. They were able to build new buildings. They were able to add expensive equipment to their laboratories. They were able to hire top-notch teachers. But at the same time as doing that, they skewed the whole thing in the direction of pharmaceutical drugs. That was the efficiency in philanthropy. The doctors from that point forward in history would be taught pharmaceutical drugs. All of the great teaching institutions in America were captured by the pharmaceutical interests in this fashion. And it's amazing how little money it really took to do it. Surgery became viable with anesthesia and infection control, and doctors advocated expensive radical operations. These in turn produced the need for a large lucrative hospital system. Radium fever swept medicine. The price of radium rose 1,000% almost overnight. Another costly technological industry entered the hospital system. A drug industry grew out of the booming patent medicine business. The doctors changed educational standards and licensing regulations to exclude the empirics. Soon, only AMA-approved doctors could legally practice medicine. In a brief 20 years, 
the AMA came to dominate medical practice. Organized medicine launched a media campaign to associate the empirics with quacks. The code word for competition was quackery. So now the average doctor goes through school, he gets a great education, uh, he has to be really smart to get through it, he learns all about drugs, he doesn't know too much about basic nutrition. I found that the average wife of these physicians knows more about nutrition than he does, but they sure know their drugs. And if you go to your typical doctor today, I don't care what it is, chances are you're gonna walk out of there with a prescription. Why? Because that's what he has been trained to do. They have carried on a war against quackery over the past uh, 60 or 80 years. Now, what they define as quackery is any treatment or medication which the AMA itself has not personally approved. And if they have not approved it, it's quackery. And if they have not approved it, the FDA is going to come and arrest you. And uh, so what it is, it's a federal enforcement of a drug trust monopoly against the interests of the American people. Now, the AMA was run by two of the most notorious quacks in the United States for over 50 years. You had a man named Doc Simmons who came up from Lincoln, Nebraska, and I was in Lincoln a couple of years ago, and a friend of mine pointed out a big gloomy place up on the hill, and he said that is where the most famous quack uh, in American history had his place before he moved to Chicago. And I said, who was that? And he said, well, the man later became head of the American Medical Association. And at that time, I knew nothing about all this, but Doc Simmons took over the American Medical Association in Chicago in 1899. He ran it for 25 years until he got in trouble with his wife. He wanted to spend more time with his mistress, and so he decided to get rid of his wife by making her a drug addict. Then he was going to put her in an insane asylum. Unfortunately, she fought back and she took him to court, and the whole plot was so, uh, so blatant that uh, he got a lot of bad publicity and he had to leave the AMA. This was the man who created the AMA as we know it today as a monolithic, tyrannical power over the entire medical profession. He was replaced by his understudy, an even greater quack named Dr. Morris Fishbein. Now, Doc Simmons had claimed to have two fake degrees, although he'd never been to medical school. Doc, uh, Dr. Fishbein claimed to have one, but he never could produce it, and he never practiced medicine a day in his life. But he ran the American Medical Association as a one-man fiefdom for the next 25 years until they kicked him out in 1948. But even after they kicked him out, the AMA continued on the course which it, is, it had followed under these two quacks. In 1952, John D. III founded the Population Council, an organization dedicated to promoting the now-debunked fear that overpopulation would ravage the Earth and cause mass death by the year 2000. Rockefeller appointed Frederick Osborne the leader of the American Eugenics Society as its first president. In the 60s, the Rockefellers funded a WHO-administered task force on vaccines for fertility regulation that developed anti-fertility vaccines, a task force that eventually succeeded in developing an anti-HCG vaccine that caused spontaneous abortions in vaccinated women. In the 90s, WHO administered tetanus vaccine programs in multiple countries were racked with scandal when it was discovered that vaccines were laced with HCG and causing spontaneous abortions in the third world populations who were being unknowingly injected with them. David Rockefeller continues to promulgate the same overpopulation fear-mongering, always framing the problem so as to posit the United Nations as the only solution, without noting that the UN was built on land donated by his family on the ashes of the League of Nations, an organization founded by Rockefellers and their family allies. Last year, David Rockefeller hosted a meeting of billionaires including Ted Turner, George Soros, Bill Gates, and others, at which they concluded that overpopulation was the world's most pressing problem. The Rockefeller Foundation gives grants to Planned Parenthood, the Population Council, and others. 
You can see here in 1997, they did a study actually giving fertility control agents to people in, in, in India. Here is the research grant in action. And if you remember just a minute ago, I talked about the Population co Council. These people are getting money from the Rockefeller Foundation. They said mass use of fertility control agent by government to regulate births at an acceptable level. This is actually here, once again, public information by the Population Council from 1969. The overall Rockefeller goal? Well, they say in part, quote, science would eventually come to control the fundamental processes of biology. They literally want to control the entire cycle of life from birth to death everything in between they want to control hormones they want to control glands they want to control genes they have no limit to what they attempt to accomplish and all their funding towards genetic research and more has been part of this goal it was part of their ultimate means of social control and social engineering eugenics Ironically, however, the very innovations that are making possible dramatic improvements in human well-being are also creating new problems which raise the specter of an alarming and possibly catastrophic disaster to the biosphere we live in. And herein lies the dilemma that we all face. Let me illustrate. Improved public health has caused the world's infant mortality rate to decline by 60% over the last 40 years. In the same period, the world's average life expectancy has increased from 46 years in 1950s to 63 years today. This is a development which, as individuals, we can only applaud. However, the result of these positive measures is a world population that has risen during the same short period of time geometrically to almost six billion people and could easily exceed six billion, eight billion by the year 2020. The negative impact of population growth on all of our planetary ecosystems is becoming appallingly evident. I'm Dr. Alan Shackelford. What you will see in this brief presentation is remarkable. It's unlike anything that I, in my 30 years of medical practice, have experienced, and it's based on medical marijuana. You may have preconceived notions about what that means, but please watch the next few minutes with an open mind. I think you'll be astonished at what you learn. So Charlotte has Dravet syndrome, it's a uh, severe pediatric epilepsy. The seizures when they start with Dravet are status, they don't stop on their own, so they're 20 minutes or 30 minutes or longer. I think her first one was about a half hour. Um, every seizure after that for two and a half years was a status seizure, and some were four hours long, two hours long, and you know, at that point she's intubated in the ER, in the, in the pediatric ICU, and medicine doesn't stop them, so that's... Um, we went through that for about two and a half years. We got diagnosed at two and a half years old. A few times her heart has stopped during these, uh, using these drugs. And um, I've done CPR on her and a couple of those times, you know, I just sort of let go of the fact that just to keep trying with her and I said my goodbyes to her and um, as I'm doing CPR on her or in the hospital, um, kind of prepared myself for the worst and she's still here but she's been through a lot to get to this point. The doctor, you know, she heard her, her history of seizures at that time and said, we have to pull this, her last med that she was on. Her exact words, we have reached the end of the line with medical options for Charlotte. And I don't know what to tell you, there's really nothing else we can do. And that's when we met the Stanleys and that's when we got started on the CBD. After six months of, I really didn't think she would survive the seizures, 300 seizures a week, roughly. 
uh, a, you know, grand mall, tonic clinic seizures a week. Just to put in light what 300 a week is, it's, it's about four an hour. It's a one seizure every 15 minutes. So, um, you know, sometimes it was every five minutes. It just never stopped. And so to see her seizure free for a whole, for seven days, she went seven days instantly. And we've been on it nine months. And from that 300 seizures a week, she now has zero to one tonic clinic a week. And um, so it's greater than 99% seizure reduction. This particular plant has 0.5% THC and 17% CBD or cannabidiol, the non-psychoactive ingredient. This plant is so important. The CBD is, is literally stopping the progression of epilepsy. This plant right here is called Charlotte's Web after our, our favorite little precious Dravet syndrome patient named Charlotte. And this is the reason we've spent two years developing this plant, and the world doesn't know about this yet. We are able to treat Charlotte through doctor-approved uh, um, channels with no psychoactive effect for Charlotte or any of the patients that are able to take this CBD plant. This, we, that's why we call this the future of medical marijuana. Uh, a lot of people think, uh, what, when we tell them what we're giving our daughter, their first reaction is, well, is she getting high? And no, that's not part of it at all. Uh, that's a common misconception. There's no psychoactive side effect. It's not psychotropic. So, but the CBD does seem to have other side effects that are have been amazing, actually. Behaviorally, it's helped her. It's helped her appetite. And I can't think of any possible negative side effect that it, it has had. Uh, she's just experienced uh, a better quality of life all the way around because of it. To be able to control seizures the way that, that this evidently is able to do in a condition which results in absolute uncontrolled seizure activity is unprecedented. Because of this medicine and these high CBD plants, we have our daughter back. We have a life back. Yeah. She has her life back. Zakai has a rare catastrophic epilepsy diagnosis called Doza syndrome. What that entails is lots of seizures every single day delayed development, autistic tendencies, um, those, that sort of thing. In the end, we had tried um, every medication that's indicated, 17 treatments in all, plus the ketogenic diet, which is a special diet for, for epilepsy. So we've really tried everything that we could. Really none of them helped or they would make his seizures worse. Um, and then the side effects from the medications, of course are ridiculous. I pulled out some scrapbooks so you could see what Sakai looked on, on steroids. He doubled his weight. He was having, the EEG showed, EEG is just an electrical scan of the brain waves and it shows the seizure activity. And he was having 200 clinical seizures an hour. And so there are, you know, eight people in his room watching him seize over and over. We were there about a week just confirmed the diagnosis and said there was nothing else they could do. And we were there to get the confirmation of what we were really dealing with, but to get help for them to help us. And, you know, they said you've really tried everything in their bag of tricks that they had. Really not to be melodramatic, but you're in really the fight for your child's <laughs> life. We finally made the decision, yes, we need to do this. We need to go ahead and get his red card and start this whole process. We were at the end of, you know, our pharmaceutical rope, so to speak, and just the, the safety profile was just unheard of. I mean, I knew that I wasn't going to kill him, giving him too much, which I couldn't say for any other medication that we've tried. A very common and obvious question is how do you administer cannabis to somebody like Zakai, who's nine years old? The first thing that pops into a person's mind is what do you do? You pop a joint in their mouth like the other end? Absolutely not. It's either administered by capsules, which they swallow, or oil syringes. You know, also I think people need to understand that we're, everything is tested. And so we know exactly the, the milligram dosage of CBD that we're giving cannabidiol. So people think that we're stopping these seizures by maybe getting the kid high, um, which isn't the case. It's actually quite a conundrum because What's happening is, is virtually all of the anti-epileptic drugs on the market are psychoactive. 
this cannabidiol extract is non-psychoactive. So we're replacing psychoactive medications with a non-psychoactive medication, which happens to come from cannabis. So that's kind of hard for people to accept. It and it's brilliant because we've been able to come off his psychoactive drug completely. At Zakai's worst, he had 200 seizures an hour, and it has been 106 days now since his last seizure. I get to say, after almost a decade, I get to meet him for the first time without all this seizure activity and drugs. If you can imagine waiting 10 years to meet your kids. You know, I don't know how you think someone who has, you know, literally saved saved your son's life. I don't know how you think someone. Like that. Really, after the euphoria wears off, that we found ourselves in such good fortune that we found, you know, the Stanleys, that we found people who care and who grow this plant. You get angry that we couldn't have tried this 500,000 seizures ago, that no one even mentioned it as an option. We love our doctor. I love him. I feel like he's in the fight with us. He signed for us. Most doctors won't. But he's never, even in all of these years, showed us the compassion that the love of Gary has. Thank God we live in Colorado, but if we didn't, I would do whatever I needed to do to be able to provide this for my child. My name is Cristina Sanchez and I work at Complutense University in Madrid, Spain and I have been working for the last decade on the anti-tumor effects of cannabinoids. In the early 1960s, Rafi Mishulam from the Hebrew University in Israel characterized the main compound in marijuana producing the psychoactive effects that we all know. The cannabis plant has been known for millennia. After the discovery of this compound that is uh, called THC, it was pretty obvious that uh, this compound had to be acting on the cells, on our organism, through a mechanism, through a molecular mechanism. And in the 1980s, two specific targets for THC were discovered, something that we call cannabinoid receptors. And after the discovery of the receptor, it was obvious that our body has to synthesize something that binds to these receptors. It was pretty obvious that it was something endogenously produced, produced by our own bodies, that was acting through these receptors. And these compounds, these endogenously produced cannabinoids, were found a few years later, and it's what we call the endocannabinoids, because they are produced endogenously inside our bodies. These compounds, the endocannabinoids, together with the receptors, and the enzymes that synthesize, that produce the endocannabinoids and that degrade the endocannabinoids are what we call the endocannabinoid system. And we now know that the endocannabinoid system regulates a lot of biological function. Appetite, food intake, motor behavior, reproduction, and many, many other functions. And that's why the plant has such a wide therapeutic potential. We started working in this project uh, 12, 15 years ago and it was basically by chance. We were working with astrocytes at that time and we decided to change the model and work with astrocytoma cells, the tumoral cells. And we observed that when we treated these cells with cannabinoids, uh, THC, the main psychoactive component of cannabis, it was killing the cells in our petri dishes. We were killing the cells. So we thought that we were facing some potential anti-tumoral responses. And then we decided to analyze these compounds in animal models of breast and brain tumors. 
The results we have obtained are telling us that cannabinoids may be useful for the treatment of breast cancer. We started to do experiments in animal models of glioblastoma, brain tumors, and we observed that they were, cannabinoids were very potent in reducing tumor growth. Cells can die in different ways, and after cannabinoid treatment, they were dying in the clean way. They were committing suicide, which is something you really want when you have a, an anti-tumoral drug. One of the advantages of cannabinoids or cannabinoids, cannabinoid-based medicines would be that they target specifically uh, tumor cells. They do not have any toxic effect on normal, non-tumoral cells. And this is uh, an advantage with respect of a standard chemotherapy that target basically everything. When we started to see these uh, anti-tumor and cell-killing effects on cancer cells, we decided to set aside our metabolic studies and to focus on, on cancer. I cannot understand why in the States uh, cannabis is under Schedule One, because it is pretty obvious not only from our work, but from work from many other researchers, that the plant has a very wide therapeutic potential. We are in contact with doctors in Spain, oncologists, neuro-oncologists and, and breast specialists that are willing to test these compounds in, in human patients. The plant, besides THC, produces cannabidiol. And this compound is very special because it is not psychoactive. It has been demonstrated that it's a very, very potent antioxidant. It protects the brain from stress and from damage, kills cancer cells, and when you combine it with THC, it uh, produces synergistic effects, which means that the effect of THC is potentiated. At this point, we have enough preclinical evidence supporting the idea that cannabinoids may have anti-tumoral properties. We, as researchers, should explore in more depth and, and, and be willing to, to try in many different pathologies. Cannabis has an enormous therapeutic potential. Doctor, I want to talk about salt. Um, a lot of people have high blood pressure. Stay away from salt, but we need it. Well, salt is an essential nutrient. Sodium and chloride, you cannot have nerve impulses without sodium chloride. They're an integral part of the biochemical system of nerve transmission. You cannot move water around in your body or retain it in the right compartments, inside your blood vessels, inside your tissues, inside the cells. You can't keep things in the right compartment without sodium chloride. The chief cells in your stomach cannot make stomach acid without Salt, okay? Salt is the raw material. Sodium chloride is the raw material to make hydrochloric acid. Now, two things have happened because of this terrible criminal advice that doctors have given. It's criminal. Anybody else do this to the American people, they'd be put in jail for life. Some of them would be executed because of the number of people who are killed over this, right? <clears throat> Salt is required to make stomach acid. You don't have enough stomach acid, you get reflux incorrectly called acid reflux. It's reflux. Mm -hmm. Reflux is caused by insufficient amounts of stomach acid, not too much stomach acid. So doctors have even named it the wrong thing, right? And basically, um, you get reflux when you don't have enough stomach acid to keep your stomach environment sterile. So yeast begin to grow in there, so you eat carbohydrates and sugar. They ferment that, produce gas, uh-oh, heartburn, pressure, reflux. Mm -hmm. Because you have all these things growing in your stomach. Okay, when you get a pH too high, you get a pH above four, all these things begin to grow. You have a pH under one, your pepsin works to digest proteins, and you can absorb minerals, you can absorb B12. If your pH gets above two, two and a half, you can't do that. Okay, so you're in trouble. I mean, you can take tons of iron supplementation, and if you don't have any stomach acid, you can't absorb iron. Now, here comes the most terrible thing that's happened to America because of this inappropriate advice. Well, there's two things. One, you go back to 1995, <clears throat> 750 people died during a triple-digit heat wave in Chicago. It was a two-week heat mm -hmm. wave, 1995, I believe it was. 750 people died here in Chicago 
and thousands of people fell out with heat stroke. The first thing they give them intravenously on the way to the hospital to get heat stroke is saline solution, which is salt water. Salt water yeah. And it's absolutely criminal that these 750 people who died were all ones who were on a salt-restricted diet. They're all seniors who were on a salt-restricted diet. They died of heat stroke because of these doctors didn't have the courtesy to call these people up in good manners just to call up and say, look, whether you believe in the salt-restricted diet or not, right now you need to put a couple of tablespoons of salt in a gallon of water and be sipping on that until the heat wave goes away. But they didn't do that. And so all those people who died of heat stroke who were under the care of doctors who were on a restricted salt diet, those doctors should be put in jail. Okay? For almost like the same thing as vehicular homicide, the same type of thing as uh, manslaughter, right? That type of thing. Um, then... Here comes the big one. Right now, on the average, from this is a Mayo Clinic study came out in 2009. They said that as many as 30 percent, 30 people out of 100 in America now have celiac disease and have trouble absorbing nutrients. And as a result, there's people with 25 legitimately diagnosed diseases, which are all nutritional deficiency diseases. They're going to 18 different specialists for all this. And they're paying, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a day to deal with this, and it's simply a gluten intolerance, and they can't, their intestines are damaged, they can't absorb nutrients. Well, when you can't digest wheat, barley, round oat glutens, and you absorb these big chunks of what's called polypeptides, your body recognizes and sets up an intolerance to those partially digested proteins you get gluten intolerance, you get celiac disease, or bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, diverticulitis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. And the doctor's approach to these diseases are cut your intestines out. I can't understand how they, you know, you have a malabsorption problem, they want to cut your intestines out. That's really dumb. But at any rate, because they have you on a salt-restricted diet, you cannot make stomach acid, so your pepsin won't work, and you cannot digest proteins, including the protein of wheat brought around oats. Now, again, there's a big research project come out in 2009 that said, uh-oh, it used to be people got celiac disease when they were kids. And if you recognize it, you can save them from all these terrible diseases because you can get them off of gluten and they'd be fine. Well, now people who could eat gluten with impunity, they were really big on eating wheat, barley, round oats, no problems. And suddenly now at age 50 or 60, they become gluten intolerant. Well, that's because over the years on a salt-restricted diet, they couldn't digest wheat, barley, round oat glutens down to their simplest amino acids. Big chunks called polypeptides are being absorbed. They set up an intolerance to it. And now at age 50, 60, we have 80 out of 100 people mm -hmm. with gluten intolerance because of this criminal advice to restrict salt. Here we go. Do you realize your mattress has the potential to be an antenna? An antenna. And your, all the electrical stuff in your room can be magnified by your mattress. The rate of breast cancer in Western countries is 10% higher in the left breast than in the right. This is also true for skin cancer melanoma. In the U.S., bed frames and box springs are made of metal, and the length of a bed is exactly half the wavelength of FM and TV transmissions. The maximum strength of the field develops 75 centimeters above the mattress, so when sleeping on your right side, your left side will be exposed to the highest field strength. <clears throat> Next. You know, is today to battle this unseen force that I know is destroying these people, and I can watch how these electrical fields are destroying people. It's very obvious after 30 years of watching unusual symptoms, and you're going to learn stuff today. <clears throat> Next. 
Earthing or grounding refers to connecting your body directly with the Earth. Earth is an electrical planet charged with a subtle surface energy commonly known as what? The ground. There's a reason it was called the ground. When in contact with the Earth, this tranquil energy naturally refers to any conductive object. Whether it's a metal rod, a wire, a tree or plant, an animal or a barefoot human, they become grounded. <clears throat> the Earth's electrical surface is always negative, meaning that the surface is filled with free electrons. They are able to move and reduce a positive charge. Next. The known effect of grounding is that it discharges and prevents the buildup of electrical stress. Your body becomes suffused with negatively charged free electrons abundantly present on the surface of the earth. Your body immediately equalizes to the same electrical energy level or potential as the earth. Walking barefoot on the earth, as humans have done throughout history, naturally grounds and discharges the body. When you go on vacation and you wander around on a beach, is it because you wandered around on the beach and you're on vacation, or was it because you grounded yourself for seven days? The ocean magnifies it. And they officially admitted that. <clears throat> and I will guarantee you the dentist will give you fluoride treatments tomorrow. Your toothpaste is saturated with it. <clears throat> and I said, take this with you to work and ask them, when are they going to find out that all this mercury was a problem too? How many people will be left? But this is how bad, <clears throat> was this in the paper? This wasn't actually in the paper. And last Friday, the free press, which would never lie to you, never, <laughs> said, there's no flu this season. There's like the flu like disappeared. They don't know where it is. There isn't any. So the fear that was supposed to be there is gone. <clears throat> Next. If I had teeth left, this is the pill you'd take if you had teeth left. By itself. By itself. If you have roots in your mouth, <clears throat> the amount of money that I blew to get my teeth jerked out from all the fluoride treatments, all the mercury, all the stuff that I went through, and it basically all happened because my father had very good insurance, and I paid dearly with my teeth for that good insurance. It cost me all of them. So when I watch these feet people getting clipped $1,500 a root canal, when I had my teeth jerked out, out of my 15 root canals, five of them were chronically abscessed. I'd have pulled them all out a second time, despite the mess they made in my mouth, because you do not want to live with your mouth aching long. And so I went through all the steps you were supposed to do, and if I could start over, I could have saved a fortune. <clears throat> Dylan, my, you, want, you try to get my son there to drill on his tooth because he'll go home and he's grown. How many cavities in your mouth have you grown out? I don't know, a few. <clears throat> he'll take any, the dentist, he will stop the dentist if he gets his teeth clean and come back and grow the cavities out taking that. And Amy did the same thing when she was pregnant. Amy grew three of them out of her teeth when she was pregnant. Dentin is raw tooth. Can I just get your recommendations for, for proper oral health care? Um, you know, what can, we, what can people do to eliminate their, at least reduce their exposure to fluoride and still maintain proper oral, oral health care? Well, 
Let me first point out the fact that fluoride does not reduce tooth decay. That okay. is a myth. And that, yeah, if you brush your teeth really hard with it, you can show a little bit of a difference. But there are other things that work much, much better that mm -hmm. never get a chance in the marketplace because we're stuck on this fluoride, basically myth. Mm -hmm. Iodine, much more effective. In my uh, YouTube channel that I have a, a, a video called Bad Bugs, and we talk about gum disease. People talk about tooth decay. Tooth decay is a disease of children because of the malnourished children. Most people lose their teeth because of gum disease. And that's a chronic disease that you get when you're a child, and by the time you get to be 30, 40, 50 years old, your teeth get loose and start falling out or being extracted or you get your gums cut off and bone graft and you spend lots of money. And basically it's an infection that you can mm -hmm. hose away with a water pick and iodine and salt and soda or something in there and hose it away because they're swimmers. You can't brush them away. It's like trying to brush a fish away. If you took a brush and rubbed it around in the pond, is the fish going to leave? No, and looks at you like you're crazy. Well, the same thing is true of the bugs in your, in your gums. They're swimmers. You can hose them away, and if you put something in the hose that they don't like, like iodine, you can hose them away and kill them while you're at it. And that's how you get to be oral health. I wrote a whole book on the subject. It's called How to Save Your Teeth with Toxic-Free Preventive Dentistry. And I've been making movies on it, a recipe for oral health. It's part of bad bugs. You can learn all this stuff just by Googling it and getting on my, mm -hmm. on my YouTube channel and watch it. Oral health is easy to create. It's just not treated right in this country. Dentists treat cavities with a drill. That's like using a knife to treat an infection. You've got to keep cutting more and more off every time. Anybody's ever had one filling, had another one and another one and another one and another one, and you say, well, well, if that solved the problem, how come we're doing this again and again and again and again? Mm -hmm. It doesn't solve the problem because tooth decay is caused by a bug called Streptococcus mutans. And if you really cared about children not having cavities, whenever they went to kindergarten or preschool, they'd have all the little kitties spit in a tube and that incubate it. And if it turns purple, they've got Streptococcus mutans. When you do that, one out of five children will turn that tube purple. So then you take that kid, have them, the mother brush the teeth with iodine or one of the bug-killing agents, and then you have them spit in the tooth again, in the tube again, and you look until that tube doesn't turn purple. You got rid of the bug that causes tooth decay. I had a guy in my practice, he never brushed his teeth. It, there was gum everywhere. And his teeth were perfectly healthy. He didn't have a cavity in his head. His gums were pink and wonderful. But when we looked under the microscope, he didn't have any crawlies. When he spit in a tube, it didn't turn purple. Hmm. Believe me, it's an infection that goes from person to person to person. DNA testing shows it's coming from the mother or a grandmother or the caregiver to the child at about age two. So it's a, it's a germ. It's transferred from the people that care for the child. All the germs in the baby's body come from mother. So, but if there happen to be a bad one in the mix, you can very simply get rid of it. Hmm. You don't need it. It's not a valuable bug. Kill it. So it's gone. Hmm. What about fluoridated water then? If, if our community has it, how do we protect ourselves? It, can filters take care of it? Do we have to resort to bottled, distilled water? What, I mean, what sort of options do people have? The options are very few. The trouble is that fluoride, as I mentioned earlier, if you have it in your mouth, it goes up in your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. If you take a shower in fluoridated water, it goes up in your bloodstream. So if you have a community that is adding this terrible poison to the water supply, that you either have to abandon your community and go out to the country and find a house that's on a well or move to another country like Mexico or Japan or that doesn't put it in the water supply, Germany, France, Holland, one of the myriad of countries that don't allow it in the water supply, or you can do what I'm telling people to do. Like me on Facebook, go to work and save your country because the problem is Industry is making billions of dollars off of this, and until enough of us stand up and say, stop it, they're going to keep doing it. It's making them money. So if we stand up and make them stop, they can find some other way to make money, maybe do something valuable for our society mm -hmm. rather than disposing of hazardous waste in our water supply. You've got to work on it. It's democracy. There are more of us than there are of them. And so put your shoulder to the wheel, and we will turn this around. Mm -hmm. I know there's communities that do debate this to whether or not to fluoridate. Do we know 
What percentage of uh, the United States is fluoridated? It's over 75 percent, and okay. it, it's all the big cities. Uh, California was one of the least fluoridated states up until 1995, and it was a market. Why was California least fluoridated? Because over 100 times the citizens of California have gone to the polls and said, not in my water. So Cargill and all the people that have the product to get rid of, American Dental Association, California Dental Association, went around Sacramento and passed out a few hundred thousand dollars. They gave Pete Wilson a hundred thousand dollars to sign the bill, governor. He comes from a city that has a law against it. That doesn't keep him from signing that. And so the by buying legislatures at the state level, several states like Kentucky and California have mandatory fluoridation bill. Kentucky's had one of the oldest ones. You know what state in the union has the most number of people with the fewest number of teeth? That would be Kentucky. So the citizens have already spoken. They're buying billions and billions of dollars of bottled water a year, but you can't take a bath in it. What if you wanted to take a jacuzzi? What if you want to go swimming and work out at the gym? You're, what if you're going to go in a sauna? You're going to get water it, your body exposed to water some way or another. Mm. So we need to have water that's pure and that that's not what you get out of the tap. And that if they're trucking the stuff in from Florida or shipping it in from China, you definitely don't want to take a bath in it. Next. <clears throat> The companies have graciously donated 12 of each of those. Yesterday in the paper, the Institute of Medicine said they set the upper limits of vitamin D at 600 units. 600 units. They finally came. One, ten, five drops of those a day is a lifeguard dose. I have lots of people on four to five drops. That's the pill form. Next. David Williams in his newsletters will put a two-year-old on a thousand international units. <clears throat> so they have had to reset all these vitamin D levels. And they said, after telling you to stay out of the sun for 50 years, that if you got enough vitamin D in your system, 77% of all cancers would not be there. 77% of all cancers would have never manifested just from vitamin D. So in the times that you've been listening to me here, vitamin D has become the most critical vitamin in cancer prevention. 70, that's huge. <clears throat> but you know how many times I've heard, I have to stay out of the sun, doctor. This is Michigan. There is no sun. Get in the sun. Get in the sun. Who spends a day in the sun and feels worse? Nobody, and still everybody avoided the sun. Psychiatry in all of, uh, all of this time doesn't have one case report of one disease validated, not one. What they do is they meet at the American uh, Psychiatric Association, they meet in the DSM committee, Diagnostic Statistical Manual Committee, and they vote on making new behavioral and, and emotional disorders and they vote, and then they start immediately calling them diseases. And they tell people, they tell the public these are diseases. Total fraud. Total fraud. The actual truth about chemical balance is that it's an actual lie. Nobody has yet measured, demonstrated, or created a test to show that somebody has a chemical imbalance in their brain. Period. What the American public should be thinking about is when they or their loved ones or their friends have received a psychiatric diagnosis, they should be asking the dog, geez dog, where's the, where's the chemical test for that? Where is the objective test for this? And I guarantee you that they'll be told, uh, we don't have a chemical test for that.
there are no biological tests for any mental illnesses that I'm aware of. There are not uh, current available tests uh, to verify your diagnosis. There is no test. There is no specific test to differentiate between, let's say, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Not a single test. Yeah, we have no, not really uh, confirma confirmatory test for the diagnosis. There is no test, there's no biopsy you can do that says uh, this person is depressed, this person is bipolar. We don't have anything really currently to identify uh, mental illness per se. No, there are no specific tests to confirm the diagnosis or show the improvement like any blood tests or any x-rays or anything like that. Oh, in my practice I don't do any tests. I just speak with people and uh, listen to them and then I make a decision in what kind of illness so there should be. Uh, we don't have, we don't really have any specific blood tests or other tests that are definitive for any mental illness whatsoever. Um, what kind of um, biological tests do we have available today for detecting mental illnesses? None. <laughs> there is no rational science behind what they think is the cause of these symptoms. The medications that are being given to people are without exception introducing chemicals that are altering the brain in ways which can be very damaging and I'll go a step further and say that in the absence of a proven chemical imbalance for which the medications are quote rebalancing or fixing the medications are in fact toxic how many patients have you been able to cure so far? <laughs> I would say one. <laughs> How many people have I cured? Well, uh, there are no real cures right now in psychiatry. <laughs> the idea of any, uh, you asked me about the issue about how many people I've cured. I don't know that any of us are ever completely cured of anything. I have not been able to cure many patients. I have cured none of my patients. So you ask to ask the classic Roman question, legal question, cui bono, who benefits? The people who make the diagnosis. With control, power, and alienation from certain groups of people who were uncomfortable to be around. They were locked up in these places to get them out of the way. Uh, the history of psychiatry, I think, really is related to institutions. Bethlehem Royal Hospital in London was one of the world's first psychiatric institutions. Commonly referred to as Bedlam, the hospital was little more than a warehouse for those deemed mad. Inmates were confined to cages, closets, and animal stalls, chained to walls, and flogged, while the asylum charged admission for public viewings. In the 18th century, William Batty was the first to promote that his institutions could cure the mentally ill. Batty's madhouses made him one of the richest men in England, though his treatments were every bit as inhumane as those practiced in Bedlam, with not a single patient cured. His financial success triggered a boom in the asylum business and an opportunity for psychiatrists to cash in on this new growth industry. This was an era where, on both sides of the Atlantic, specialized institutions for the mentally ill are beginning to be built in large numbers. Those institutions date back certainly to the beginning of the 18th century, and in a few cases even earlier than that. Uh, but the explosive growth of an asylum sector of asylumdom, as some historians have called it, is very much a, a 19th century phenomenon. Uh, it's that period when the state is persuaded to invest tax dollars in building these places. But while those who ran the institutions were getting rich, 
psychiatrists yet lack the credibility to maximize their cash flow. In order to justify their profession, they needed to come up with these biological solutions, or they didn't, didn't have any profession. The only way for them to solve that was to attempt to start uh, believing that, that these people that were suffering from emotional disorders was from, from a biological basis. Whatever was done to make this person more manageable would be simply called a treatment. And the sad reality is that many of these so-called treatments were in essence torture. The near drowning devices that were developed in this period, for example, must have been appallingly frightening. For example, one device involved putting the patient into a coffin, closing the lid and dumping it into a bath of water, and then opening it up and trying to revive the patient. There were a range of these things and the mortality rate was, was very, very high. Psychiatrists next sought to give credence to their practices by cloaking them in the language of medicine. This repackaging of treatment became known as the medical model. Well, somebody who's really hyper and manic, uh, if you're wrapped up in a cold sheet and dunked into some water, you're going to quit acting manic because that's a punishing uh, treatment. So, but as soon as the symptoms started to go away, they started to believe that somehow by wrapping them up and dunking them in cold water, it was um, draining the toxics out of their body. So they built the medical model around that. Pushing the biological theory of mental illness a step further, an American, Benjamin Rush, put forth the idea that insanity was caused by too much blood in the head. The cure? Remove the blood by any means possible. Restraint, cold water, bleeding, even terror. And with that, a new medical model was created. Benjamin Rush was probably the most famous American physician of the revolutionary era. Uh, Rush was known as the master bleeder. He bled his patients for madness. He also invented something called the tranquilizer. It's a chair that looks a little bit like an electric chair. The patient was confined in this apparatus, uh, sometimes with cold water applied to his or her head, for some hours at a time, and Rush announces in a letter that he's invented this new contraption and dubbed it the tranquilizer. Do you think parasites are connected with a lot of the diseases we have today? Um, no. I think it exists. I don't think it's a big problem. Are you interested in knowing what parasites do to you? Probably, I mean, yeah. Probably not for me. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'll be honest, it doesn't really interest me. There's tons of people that have parasites and don't even know it. It's a big, very big issue. And at the beginning, I didn't believe that I had parasites. People need to cleanse more often. I did. I had parasites. That was nasty thing. I was really shocked when I found out that this is something that affects every single living human, in fact, every single living organism on the face of the earth. I experienced uh, parasites coming out of my body uh, about three, four, five times. You could be leading a healthy lifestyle. You could be jogging, eating raw food, taking vitamins and all those kind of things, but these guys don't care. These guys are persistent. They're dangerous. They're deadly. They've been around for millions of years. They know what they're doing, and they're in of all of us and we're constantly being exposed to this. There's definitely a problem with it. There's a war going on and it's going on inside every one of us and this is something that we all need to take very seriously. This is not science fiction. This is scary, it's real, and it's serious. Monsters living inside us, they eat our bodies and control our emotions, urges, and thoughts. A Discover Magazine feature article said that every living thing has at least one parasite that lives inside of it and humans have far more. 
This silent issue is so important, former President Jimmy Carter is putting intensive efforts into increasing global awareness of this serious issue. As a colon hydrotherapist for approximately 20, 21 years now, you wouldn't believe what I see coming out of people's bodies. This is not just a third world country thing. Everybody has them. Even normal people with lots of money living in suburbia who take showers three times a day. If you eat sushi, you have parasites. One square inch of raw sushi meat can contain 10,000 parasite larvae and eggs that begin hatching inside you the minute you eat it. The most common kind is tapeworms, which can grow to 60 feet long and live in your intestines for decades. When I have clients that absolutely love sushi, I find that they have an inordinate amount of that particular uh, problem, of like clusters of parasites. If you have pets, you are guaranteed to have parasites. It doesn't matter if you're vegetarian, raw foodist, vegan, or macrobiotic. Even the healthiest and richest people on earth have parasites. You can't kill them all only control them because our bodies have trillions of cells which rely on helpful bacteria like probiotics to work right. If we kill all the organisms in our body, we kill ourselves. The secret is to keep the bad guys to a minimum. Make our bodies so healthy and clean, the undesirable guests won't want to stick around. Don't feed them the junk food they love. Sweet stuff, bread, alcohol, rice, pasta, milk, cookies, crackers, cereal, meat, cheese, cooked foods, refined carbohydrates, soft drinks, commercial fruit juices, junk foods. They love the food you love and hate the food you hate. Even letting yourself become run down energetically allows them to get stronger. So who's winning, you or them? There are hundreds of thousands of types of parasites ranging from huge worms to the single-celled amoebas that can cross the blood-brain barrier and begin digesting your brain and other organs like your liver, heart, and kidneys. They are silent. They move very slowly so you don't feel them or know they are there. That's how they want it. If you don't know they're there, then you won't do anything about it. They are smart. Parasites are living alien creatures who live off of others. They eat your food. They poop their waste inside you, making your blood, lymph, and tissues toxic. We are living in their sewage. Did you know one-third of your poop isn't even yours? It's waste that's been pooped out by parasites. You think you're clean? Think again. Everyone has parasites. They're everywhere. It's almost impossible not to come in contact with them. They are in the air. You can breathe them in. A single handshake can transfer over half a million organisms. Anything other people touch, shopping carts, door handles, toilet seats, doorknobs, signature pens, daycare centers, diaper changes, and pets, which pick up tiny unseen organisms from the ground they walk on, carpeting, grass, dirt, lawns, especially grass and lawns that have been used for defecating. Animals lick their butt and then lick their fur, and then you pet that fur, absorbing parasites directly into your skin, while others wait for you to put your hand near your face, where they enter through the nose, mouth, and eyes. They eat your food and use your body as a breeding ground sucking you drive nutrition energy and life force some worms can lay millions of eggs a day if you break apart a tapeworm the broken part can regrow into another worm common signs of parasites are you're tired a lot sleeping problems constant itching weakness headaches lack of appetite or hungry all the time especially for sweet foods and carbs flu-like symptoms depression skin problems acne arthritis joint pains eczema dermatitis sinus problems breathing and lung problems like pneumonia then uncontrollable coughing lumps under the skin cysts diarrhea and constipation sometimes alternating back and forth mucus in your stool irritable bowel syndrome stomach aches cramps digestion problems nausea overly dry lips, vision and eye problems, gas, bloating. Parasites can burrow into your brain and cause nerve damage and eye problems. They can multiply so much in your gut what you think is fat may in fact be entire nests of parasites. They can clog up your digestive tract so much no food can get through making you constipated. They love to live in your stomach and intestines because that's where all the food goes and you feed them every day. As a matter of fact, it's said that almost every health condition known can be connected with parasites in some way. I've seen actual tapeworms come out of a person, it looked like flat long spaghetti strands, two of them. A 40-foot tapeworm can have three to four thousand segments, each one of which can grow into its own piece. It can lay over one million eggs a day. If you are skinny and have trouble gaining weight or have ever had a dog lick your face, if you have abdominal cramping or appendix pains or liver, gallbladder, pancreas issues or lung problems, you might very well be host to one or more huge tapeworms. Pinworms. If you have sleeping problems, itchy butt, joint pain or female problems, those are common pinworm symptoms. Whipworms are a type of roundworm that secretes a digestive fluid
fluid that liquefies your colon wall so they can eat it. Over one billion people have whipworms. Roundworms look like fat spaghetti and are one of the most common human infections. One roundworm can lay two million eggs per day and they can live for years. They hatch in your colon, then penetrate the intestinal wall, enter the bloodstream and lymph system, and then make their way to the liver, heart, and eventually the lungs where they grow to two inches long, pass through the air sacs, into the throat, causing uncontrollable coughing where they are swallowed so they can go back down in the intestines where they lay more eggs and start the whole thing all over again. Roundworms cause pneumonia-like symptoms, breathing problems, chest tightness, asthma, heart problems, fluid retention, mucus in the lungs, nagging cough, digestive problems, stomach pains, cramping, nausea, bloating, malnutrition, protruding stomach, and intestinal blockages. Sushi is one of the major sources of tapeworms, which can grow to over 50 feet long in your intestines. Walking barefoot is a good way to pick them up, not just in dirt and grass or in the house of pets, but also the beach. Hookworms. Remember the movie Alien? Hookworms have four sets of teeth so they can eat your intestinal walls and suck your blood. People with hookworms lose a lot of blood and don't even know it. Parasites can penetrate the placenta in a pregnant woman and enter the baby. They can even be passed through breast milk. Parasites can even contribute to infertility and childbirth difficulties. If a child is born, it can have retarded mental and physical abilities. People with parasites are never living life to its fullest capacity because they are sucked dry of energy, minerals, nutrition. They are tired all the time, depressed, and barely alive. All of their life force goes to the parasites. We're all subject to this, like it or not. It's a fact. Tests done at funeral homes show that 97% of the body fluids in people were totally consumed with parasites and worms. Scientists are just beginning to discover exactly how powerful and disturbing these hidden monsters can be. Our cells are controlled by chemical signals. Parasites emit a chemical that directly affects our behavior, thoughts, decisions, and urges. Think about that. Something inside us that's not us, causing us to make unsafe decisions so we eat, drink, and do things that benefit the parasite, including physical contact with other people so the parasite can spread. Why do we eat foods and do things we know are bad for us? Why is this so hard to resist? They look like snakes. Even the book of these scenes refers to the parasite as Satan, the serpent living inside us, tempting us, ruining our health, breaking apart our relationships and ruining our lives. Throughout all of history, they've been warning us. Think about it. From the very beginning, Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent. What's really creepy is the thought there's a serpent within each of us, tempting us to do things we really shouldn't. In this engraving from the 1500s, we can see Adam and Eve feeding the serpent, the parasite. To many, true health and being in a loving monogamous relationship is paradise, and feeding the serpent exiles you from paradise. Everything is more connected than you think. What you eat, who and what you touch, your health, your moods, your relationships, everything. What can you do about it? Start by doing the right thing. Don't give in to temptation. Clean your environment and your body. Stop eating foods that feed parasites. Do a serious three-month parasite cleanse. Part one, the kidney, under regulation from other organs, other tissues, other hormones, uh, regulates that constancy uh, of the internal environment, and a byproduct of doing so is the production of about one and a half liters of urine per day. Most people are born with two normal kidneys. In each kidney, there are approximately one million filters. These filters are called glomeruli. They filter out the blood, which passes on one side of the filter. The extra salt and water that we take in passes through the filter. Waste products passes through the filter, and all of this comes out in the final urine. On a ballpark average, uh, we, we make a huge amount of this filter, 170 liters. The kidney actually has to do a tremendous amount of work. It's filtering the water and electrolytes out of the blood. And of these 170 liters of stuff that it takes out on an average, all but one or one and a half liter is reabsorbed in the system as it passes through the filter and the pipes and ultimately comes out into the terminal part of the kidney and there's a tube called the ureter that comes to the bladder and out. The kidneys, the remarkable homeostatic organs that help keep constant the volume and chemical composition of body fluids. The kidney has been designed 
over many millions of years by powers far greater than us and it's been designed in a fashion uh, to help the organism that is human beings the most uh, if it were created in a fashion where it let loose of all kinds of valuable vitamins and nutritional products it wouldn't have been designed very well what you're doing with the urine therapy is actually using it as a way to stimulate the immune system it works as, an, as a vaccination it contains a whole bunch of antibodies and antigenes uh, and uh, and it, it is sort of custom a uh, sort of custom made medicine for yourself what happens when you get exposed to a virus your body produces an antigen antibody complex it comes through the bloodstream when you have too much of that it cannot go into the tissue it comes out in the urine when you take it back into your body either through injections or to uh, implants or even shrinking it, what happens is that that antibody antigen complex will stimulate the immune system. The antibodies, frankly, don't usually appear in urine. And I would be surprised if uh, in all the studies that I've looked at, there aren't too many diseases where antibodies appear in urine in sufficient quantity to be of any significance from a therapeutic point of view. Many times an antibody is a marker of a disease, but not protective in any sense. It's a misnomer to call urine a waste. The bottom line is that urine is made through the kidneys. As the blood flows through the body, it, it is filtered through the kidneys. It is done every minute of, of the day. Uh, the reason for that is that we eat and drink more than we need, essentially, in vitamins and minerals and liquids. Urine, when it is first voided, is 100% sterile. Now, over time, bacteria will grow in it, but when it's first voided, it is sterile. Urine is antibacterial, antiviral, antiprotozoal, which means against protozoal or uh, against parasites. Um, you can use, basically, urine for almost anything. Well, it is. It's like plasma. It's the same. It is plasma. I've injected it into my veins just as an experiment. I had the opportunity once to actually compare the taste and appearance of serum from my own blood with my own urine. The serum is that liquid portion of the blood. It's not the red blood cells that gives it the color, but it's the, the portion that generally rises to the top of a test tube if you allow blood to, to sit for a while. And uh, the taste of the serum and the taste of the urine are remarkably similar. And in fact, urine is the blood. You really don't need a diagnosis. If you're sick with the urine therapy, you just drink your urine and it will cure it. If somebody is really sick, becomes a vegetarian and starts urine therapy, I don't care what kind of illness they have, they're going to get well. And if they continue that, they're going to live a long, healthy life. All over the world, throughout history, urine has been one of the most commonly used medicinals ever. In fact, probably more people have used urine than any other single substance in the history of the world for healing. Ayurvedic medicine is the natural system of healing that evolved some time around 3,500 years ago on the subcontinent of India. One of the earliest scriptures in the Indian tradition dealing with urine therapy was the Dharma Tantra. In this book, they refer to a urine therapy as Shivambu. It has the name within it of Shiva, the god of destruction making reference to the idea that urine therapy was seen as a tool for destroying and eradicating disease from the body. Here you see Darvantari. He's the father of Ayurveda. And he's holding in his hand a beautiful container. Okay? They said that this may be just to show us the fountain of health that is the urine within ourselves. In China, 3,000 years ago, the older Oriental men and the older Oriental women would drink the young boys' and the young girls' urine. And the reason for that is that, as we know, our urine contains everything, all the components of the body, so the young boys' urine was full of testosterone, which would keep a man young and, and vital and, uh, and healthy, and the young girls' urine was full of estrogen, so this would help to uh, keep the older women from aging and keep the collagen levels in their skin and so on. There are inscriptions also in, in hieroglyphics on some of the Egyptian uh, uh, remainders, which basically say, be sure to drink your urine every day and don't tell the poor people about it. Urine was used in ancient Rome as a washing detergent, and uh, uh, they, they used to collect 
urine in big stone vases on every corner of the road. And they would bring this urine to, uh, to the city laundrette. The Eskimos have used it and, and some of them are still using it. Natives of South America have used it and some of them still do. The ab aboriginals were very well acquainted with the use of urine. There is evidence of uh, nomads in the Middle East using urine as a health thing, but also as a, a washing method. They wash their bodies with either human urine or camel urine. Well, yes, I, I use it on my face, my eyes, my, my uh, ears, also when, when I have pain. And, but all the ladies are, are looking at me like, uh, do you use cosmetic or something? No, that's a grace of God. <laughs> People say I look good for 63 years old. I don't look that bad. It's, it's beautiful. Once people work through their own prejudice, like my wife, she said once she got through her own prejudice and realized it's, 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 it was her because she couldn't humble herself enough to accept it. And after it got through it, we're our family. We use it. And it's, it's a good thing for us.